Namaste. So let's continue with the introduction to Sri Shiva Sahasranama. Idan dhyana midan yogam midan dhyayam anuttamam Idan japya midan dhyanam brahasya midan uttamam Idan dhyatvan takale pi gatche di paramangati This abstract of names that I shall recite to you is looked upon as yoga. This is looked upon as the highest object of meditation. This is that which one should constantly recite as japa. This is knowledge. This is the highest mystery. Now, this is a funky translation. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, most of the scholars who translated the Mahabharata, where this selection is from, were actually agents of the British government. And they were looking for uh, philosophical clues that would allow them to defeat and disempower the Vedic culture. So, you know, their translations are very biased and often don't really match the text. And that's a, certainly one of the problems here. So let's go through it, <laughs> try to figure out what it really means. Idang dhyanam. This is meditation. This chanting these thousand names of Shiva. This is a meditation. It's not the only meditation is uh, contemplation of Brahman or the void or anything impersonal. The contemplation and meditation on the form of Shiva is also just as good because, like Zen, Shiva is not a part of the material universe. Shiva is transcendental. He's outside. And the example that we bring up all the time is the pillar of fire, the Agni Lingo. Neither Brahman nor Vishnu could find the top or the bottom. So that means the material universe is not big enough. <laughs> to enclose or define or uh, fit Lord Shiva. He's beyond everything. Idang yoga. This is yoga. Not standing on your head or, you know, chanting, Aum. No, that's not yoga. Yoga, real yoga, is that activity derived from the Vedic scriptures not from somebody's speculation or fashion. Huh? But yoga means linking. It comes from the word yukt, the verbal root in Sanskrit that means joining together, hooking up, hitching up, like a horse to a cart. So yoga really means when the individual soul is linked with the divine or the Godhead, by means of some process. And in this case, the process is chanting these thousand names. And then what? Idam dhyaya. That this is the ultimate object of meditation. This is what the yogis go and sit in the caves in Himalayas, or go to the holy places in South India. I've seen it. In Tiruvannamalai, there are thousands of yogis, and they line the road, especially uh, on the full moon days and new moon days, when pilgrims come all over, sometimes millions of pilgrims come to go around the holy mountain, Pradakshina. So these yogis, what are they doing? Hell. They're chanting mantras. They're not just simply doing physical exercises or something like that. It's about where you focus your mind. And that is because, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> Dhyayamanutamam, the ultimate form of meditation, 
idang japyam. This should be recited. It should be recited over and over again. Any of the shlokas from either this introduction or the thousand names themselves can be recited as japa, as a mantra. So that's why the next one, idang jnana. Idang jnana. As we said, anyone who is in touch with Shiva by means of Shiva consciousness, meaning focusing the mind on Shiva by any means, and certainly chanting these holy names is a powerful means of concentrating the mind on Shiva. Rahasyam idilutamam. This is the greatest secret, the greatest mystery. Rahasyam. This is not an ordinary secret. Rahasya Uttama, the greatest secret, the greatest mystery. Because how is it that a living entity, a jiva, an individual soul, who is furthermore conditioned by the material world, the material energy, ignorance, and karma, and so many other problems, shortcomings, imperfections, misgivings, and so on. How is it that one of these can actually get in touch with Shiva? Anyone who chants these holy names, whether of Shiva or Krishna or Rama or whoever, any of the deities, any of the Vishnu Tattva or Shiva Tattva deities, gets the experience very quickly of being personally in touch with God. Now, the skeptical people will say, oh, this is just imagination. This is just a dream. And, and we admit this is a function of swapna consciousness, dream consciousness. On the other hand, this is the technique that allows us to master swapna to take control of our dreams, to fill the mind with impressions that, when we enter the dream state, result in wonderful dreams, beautiful dreams. No more bad dreams. No more fear. So this is what anyone experiences who actually practices what these shlokas are describing. Now, the next line is a bit of an anomaly. Idam gyadvantakale pi kachedin paramangatim. It really goes with the next translation, but somehow the verses and translations got a little mixed up in this edition. At the end of life, antakale gyadva, uh, this practice, this knowledge, Api, certainly, Kacheri Paramanga team gives the highest destination. See, this is what this really is all about. This is what yoga, meditation, tantra, and so on is really for. That in the next life we will get the highest destination. That could be Vishnu Loka, it could be Goloka Vrindavan, it could be Shiva Loka, it could be Devi Loka, any of the higher planets, any of the higher worlds. We call them planets because when you're there, it appears like a planet. But they're subtle worlds, higher dimensional worlds. And they have all kinds of properties that this material world lacks. And we'll be getting into that in an upcoming series where we talk about dream time and the meaning of the spiritual worlds and the qualities of those worlds and how we can access them. Let's take a quick look at the next verse. Pavitrang mangalang punyang kalyana midamuttamang nigadishye mahabaho stavanamuttamang stavang 
If one, even during his last moments, recites it or hears it recited unto him, one succeeds in attaining to the highest end. This is holy. This is auspicious. This is fraught with every kind of benefit. This is the best of all things. So we covered attaining the highest destination in the translation of the previous verse, because that's where it really belongs. But in this verse, this is holy. This is like the greatest gift, the most auspicious thing you can do. It gives merit, and merit is what brings us to a higher destination. Punya means good karma, subha karma. And kalyana midamuttamam, of all things, this is the greatest. This is the highest. That this is not just hype, you know. This is not just uh, sectarian uh, boasting. No, this is real. This is really the way it is. Uh, these works, these Vedic works, don't lie. Maybe sometimes they use stories to make their points, and whether those stories are actually historical or not doesn't really matter, because the stories themselves are symbols, are metaphors for higher truths that are very difficult to describe in words, especially to laymen to people who don't have extensive background in the scriptures. So by means of stories, we can get the point across and you can understand the real benefits of chanting these thousand names. Stavan anmuta mang stavang. Of all things, this is the best. Huh? We want so many things in this world. Food, shelter, a nice body, a nice family, uh, a nice mate, a nice job, <laughs> a nice car and house, and so many things we want. But these are all temporary. The, really, the best things in life are the things that don't decay, as Jesus said, where moth and rust do not decay. This is what we want. We want benefits from our work that don't go away, that don't decay, that don't get used up, that don't disappear with time. That means the only things worth striving for are transcendental. Relationship with God is really the main thing. This is what makes us really happy in any condition of life. So we should strive our best. We should put our best effort into approaching whatever form of God we find attractive. And by service and worship and meditation, create a relationship with that Lord that is not subject to decay or death or time. This is the real benefit of all these processes of yoga. Om Tat Sat, Om Shakti Om, Om Namah Shivaya.